Live from New York, it's theCUBE. Covering theCUBE, New York City 2018. Brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media and its ecosystem partners. Hello everyone, welcome back to CUBE NYC. This is theCUBE's special presentation of something that we've done now for the past couple of years. IBM has sponsored an influencer panel on some of the hottest topics in the industry, and of course, there's no hotter topic right now than AI. So we've got nine of the top influencers in the AI space, and we're, gonna, we're in Hell's Kitchen, and it's going to get hot in here. <laughs> and these guys are going to, we're going to cover the gamut. So first of all, folks, thanks so much for joining us today. Really, as John said earlier, we'd love the collaboration with you all, and uh, we'll definitely see you on, on social after the fact. I'm Dave Vellante with my co-host for this session, Peter Burris, and again, thank you for, 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 to IBM for, for sponsoring this and organizing this. IBM has a big event down here in conjunction with Strata called Change the Game, Winning with AI. We run the Cube NYC, we've been, been here all week. So here's the format. Well, I'm going to kick it off and then you, we'll see where it goes. So I'm going to introduce each of the panelists and then ask you guys to answer a question well, I'm oh, sorry, first, tell us a little bit about yourself briefly and then answer one of the following questions. Two big themes that have come up this week. One has been, because this is our ninth year covering what used to be Hadoop world, which kind of morphed into big data. Question is, AI, big data, same wine, new bottle? Or is it really substantive and driving real business value? So that's one question to ponder. The other one is, You've heard the term, the phrase, data is the new oil. Is data really the new oil? Wonder what you think about that. Okay, so Chris Penn, let's start with you. Uh, Chris is co-founder of Trust Insight, longtime Cube alum and friend. Thanks for coming on. Tell us a little bit about yourself and then pick one of those questions. Sure, we're a data science consulting firm. We're an IBM business partner. When it comes to data as the new oil, I love that expression because it's completely accurate. Crude oil is useless. You have to extract it out of the ground, refine it, and then bring it to distribution. Data is the same way, where you have to have developers and data architects get the data out. You need data scientists and tools like Watson Studio to refine it, and then you need to put it into production, and that's where marketing technologists, technologists, data, business analytics folks, and tools like Watson Machine Learning are help bring the data and make it useful. Okay, great, Th thank you. All right, Tony Flath is, the, is a tech and media consultant uh, focus on cloud and cybersecurity. Welcome. Thank you. Tell us well, a little bit about yourself and your thoughts on one of those questions. Sure thing. Well, thanks so much for, for having us on the show. Really appreciate it. Uh, my background is in cloud, cybersecurity, and uh, certainly in emerging tech with artificial intelligence. Certainly touched it from you know a cybersecurity play, how you can use machine learning, machine control for better controlling security across the, the gamut. But I'll touch on your question about uh, you know, wine. Is it a new bottle, new wine? What, what, you know, where does this come from, from artificial intelligence? And I really see it as a whole new wine that is coming along. When you look at emerging technology and you look at all the deep learning that's happening, it's going just beyond, you know, being able to machine learn and know what's happening. It's making some meaning to that data. And things are being done with that data from robotics, from automation, from all kinds of different things. Where we're at a point in society where data or technology is getting beyond us. Prior to this, it's always been command and control. You control data from a keyboard. Well, this is passing us. So my passion and perspective on this is the humanization of it, of IT. How do you ensure that people are in that process, right? Excellent, and we're going to come back and talk Perfect. about that a lot. Uh, so Carla much. Gentry at Data Nerd. Great to see you in live as opposed to just you know in the ether on Twitter. Uh, data scientist and owner of Analytical Solution. Welcome, your oh, thoughts. Well, thank you for having us. Um, mine is, is data the new oil, and I'd like to rephrase that is data equals human lives. So with all the artificial intelligence and everything that's going on and all the algorithms and models that's being created, we have to think about things being biased, being fair, uh, and, and understand that this data has impacts on people's lives. Great. Steve Adere, my paisan, <laughs> paisan. Uh, AI startup advisor. Welcome. Thanks for coming to the queue. Thanks, Dave. So uh, my first career was geology, and I've used AI is uh, the new oil. But 
uh, data is new oil, but AI is the refinery. Um, I've used that you know, many times before. Um, in fact, I'm really, I've moved from just AI to augmented intelligence. So augmented intelligence is really the way forward. This was a presentation I gave at IBM Think last spring. Has almost 100,000 impressions right now. And the fundamental reason why is machines can attend to vastly more information than humans, but you still need humans in the loop. And we can talk about what they're bringing in terms of common sense reasoning, because big data does the who, what, when, and uh, where, but not the why. And why is really the holy grail for causal analysis and reasoning. Excellent. Uh, uh, Bob Hayes, Business Over Broadway. Welcome. Great to see you again. Thanks for having me. <clears throat> uh, so my background is in psychology, industrial psychology. And I'm interested in things like customer experience, data science, machine learning, and so forth. And I'll answer the question around big data versus AI. And I think there's other terms we could talk about, big data, data science, machine learning, AI. And to me, it's kind of all the same. It's always been about analytics and getting value from your data, big, small, what have you. Uh, and there's subtle differences between, among those terms. Machine learning is just about making a prediction you know, and knowing if, if, if things are classified correctly. Data science is more about understanding why things work and understanding maybe the ethics behind it, what, what variables are predicting that outcome. So, but still, it's all the same thing. It's all about using data in a way that, that we can get value from that as a society. And right. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Theo Lau, founder of Unconventional Ventures. What's your story? Yes, yeah, so um, my background is uh, driving technology innovation. So together with my partner, what I work does is we work with organizations to try to help them leverage technology to drive systematic financial wellness. We connect founders, startup founders with funders. We help them get money in the ecosystem. We also work with them to look at how do we leverage emerging technology to do something good for the society. So very much on point to what Bob was saying about. So when I look at AI, AI is not new, right? It's been around for quite a while. But what's different is the amount of technological power that we have allow us to do so much more than what we were able to do before. And so what my mantra is, great ideas can come from anywhere in the society, but it's our job to be able to leverage technology to shine a spotlight on people who can use this to do something different, to help you know, seniors in our country to do better in their financial planning. Okay, so in your, in your mind, it's not just a, a, a same wine new bottle, it's more substantive than that. Is it's that more substantive, it's a right? much better bottle. Karen Lopez, Senior Project Manager for Architect Info Advisors, welcome. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm Data Chick on Twitter, and that, so that kind of tells my focus is that I'm here, I also call myself a data evangelist, and that means I'm there at organizations helping stand up for the data because to me that's the proxy for standing up for the people and the places and the events that that data describes. That means I have a focus on security, data privacy, and protection as well. And I'm going to kind of combine your two questions about Great. whether data is the new wine bottle, I think, is the combination. Oh, see, now I'm talking about alcohol. But anyway, um, you know, the, all analogies are imperfect. So whether we say it's the new wine or, you know, same wine or whether it's oil, is that the analogy is good for both of them. But unlike oil, you know, the, the amount of data is just growing like crazy. And the oil we know at some point, I, I kind of doubt that we're going to hit, hit peak data where we have not enough data um, like we're going to do with oil. But that says to me that how did we get here with big data, with uh, machine learning and AI? And from my point of view as someone who's been focused on data for 35 years, we have hit this perfect storm of open source technologies, cloud architectures and cloud services, um, data innovation, that if we didn't have those, we wouldn't be talking about large machine learning and deep learning type things. So because we have all these things coming together at the same time, we're now explosions of data, which means we also have to protect them and protect the people from doing harm with data. We need to do data for good things and all of that. Great, that's a definite difference is we're, we're not running out of data. Data is like the terrible tribbles. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but they're, it's very cuddly data. Is. Yeah, cuddly data. Mark Lind, uh, founder of uh, Relevant Track. That's right. Uh, I like the name. What, what, oh, what's your story? Well, thank you. Yeah, it actually plays into what my interest is. It's mainly around AI um, and enterprise operations and cybersecurity. Um, you, you know, these teams that are in enter enterprise operations, both, uh, you know, it can be sales, marketing, all the way through the organization, as well as cybersecurity, they're often undersourced. 
and they need, off of what, what Steve pointed out, is they need augmented intelligence. They need to take AI, the big data, all the information they have, and make use of that in a way where they're able to, uh, even though they're under-sourced, uh, make some use and some value for the organization, um, you know, make better use of the resources they have um, to, you know, grow and support uh, the strategic goals of the organization. And oftentimes, you know, when you get to budgeting, um, it doesn't really align. You know, you're short people, you're short time, but the data continues to grow, as Karen pointed out. So when you take those together, using AI to augment, provide augmented intelligence to help them get through that data, make real uh, uh, tangible decisions based on information um, versus just raw data, um, especially around cybersecurity, which is a big hit right now, uh, is really a great place to be, and there's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of exciting stuff in that area. Great, thank you. Uh, Kevin L. Jackson, author and founder of GovCloud? GovCloud, yes. that's big. Yeah, GovCloud Network. Thank you very much for having me on the show. Okay. I've been um, working on uh, cloud computing initially in the federal government uh, with the intelligence community as they adopted cloud computing for a lot of the uh, nation's major missions. And what's, what has happened is now and I'm working a lot with commercial organizations and with the security of that data. And I'm going to sort of, uh, on your questions, piggyback on Karen. There was a time when you would get a couple of bottles of wine and they would come in and you would savor that wine and sip it and it would take a few days to get through it and you would enjoy it. The problem now is that you don't get a couple of bottles of wine into your house. You get two or three tankers of, of data. Um, so it's not that it's a new wine, you're just getting a lot of it. And the, the infrastructures that you need, before you could have a couple of computers and a couple of people, now you need cloud, you need automated infrastructures, you need huge capabilities. And artificial intelligence and AI, it's what's what we can use as the tool on top of these huge infrastructures to, you know, drink that, you know, fire hose of wine. Yeah. Fire, fire hose, fire of, hose wine. of wine. <laughs> Everybody's having a good time. Yeah. Everybody's having a great time. <laughs> yeah, the, things are booming right now. <laughs> so, excellent. Well, thank you all for, for those intros. Uh, uh, Peter, I want to ask you a question. So I've, I heard there are some similarities and some definite differences. You ha with regard to data being the new oil, you have a perspective on this, uh, and I wonder if you could inject it into the conversation. Sure, so the perspective that we take in a lot of conversations with a lot of folks here on theCUBE, what we've learned, and I'll, and I'll kind of answer both questions a little bit. Um, first off, on the question of data as new oil, we definitely think that data is the new asset that yeah. business is going to be built on. In fact, our perspective is there really is a difference between business and digital business, and that difference is data as an asset. And if you want to understand data transformation, you understand the degree to which a business is reinstitutionalizing work, reorganizing its people, reestablishing its mission around what you can do with data as an asset. The difference between data and oil, though, is that oil still follows the economics of scarcity. Data is one of those things you can copy it, you can share it, you can easily corrupt it, you can mess it up, you can do all kinds of awful things with it if right. you're not careful. And it's that core fundamental proposition that as an asset, when we think about cybersecurity, we think in many respects that is the approach to how we go about privatizing data so that a, the, so we can predict who's actually going to be able to appropriate returns on it. So it's a good analogy, but as, as you said, it's not entirely perfect, in a th but it's not perfect in a really fundamental way. It's not following the laws of scarcity, and that is an enormous effect. In other words, I could put oil in my car or I can put oil in my house, but I can't put the you same oil in both. can't put it in both places. Yeah, right. And now on the issue of the wine, I think it's, uh, we, we think, is uh, that it, in fact, there is a, it is a uh, new wine. And the uh, very simple gen uh, uh, abstraction or generalization we come up with is, uh, is the issue of agency. Uh, that analytics has historically not taken on agency. It hasn't acted on behalf of the brand. AI is going to act on behalf of the brand. Now, you're going to need both of them. You can't separate them. A lot of implications there in terms of bias, Absolutely. in terms of privacy. You have a yeah. thought here, Chris? You... Well, I was 
the scarcity is our compute power and the ability for us to process. I mean, it's the same as oil. There's a ton of oil under the ground, right? We can't get to it as efficiently or without severe environmental consequences to use it. Yeah, when you use it, it's transformed, but our scarcity is compute power and our ability to use it intelligently. We've but even when you find it, I have data, I can apply it to six different, six different applications. Mm -hmm. I have oil, I can apply it to one. And that's going to matter in how we think about work. But one thing I'd like to add, sort of you're talking about data as an asset. The issue we're having right now is we're trying to learn how to manage that asset. Artificial intelligence is a way of managing that asset. And that's important if you're going to use and leverage big data. Yeah, but see, everybody's talking about the quantity, the quantity. It's, it's, it's not always the quantity. You know, we can have just oodles and oodles of data, but if it's not clean data, if it's not alphanumeric data, which is what needed for machine learning. So, it, you know, having lots of data is great, but you have to think about the signal versus the noise. So sometimes you get so much data, you're looking at overfitting. Sometimes you get so much data, you're looking at biases within the data. So it's not the amount of data. It's the now that we have all of this data, making sure that we look at relevant data, making sure we look at clean data. Yeah, one more I, thought, and then we, yeah, yeah, we have a lot to cover. Sure, I want to get now, inside your big brain. I was just thinking about it from a cybersecurity cyber perspective. One of my customers, um, they were looking at the data that just comes from the perimeter, your firewalls, routers, all that, and then not even looking internally, just the perimeter alone. And the amount of data being pulled off of those and then trying to correlate that data so it makes some type of business sense or they can determine if there's incidents or th incidents that may happen and take a predictive action or threats that, that might be there because they haven't taken a certain action prior. It's overwhelming to them. So having AI now to be able to go through the logs to look at, and, and there's so many different types of data um, that come through those logs, but being able to pull that information as well as looking at endpoints and all that and, and people's houses, which are an extension of the network oftentimes, it's an amazing amount of data, and they're only looking at a small portion today because they, they don't, there's not enough resources, there's not enough uh, trained people to do all that work. So AI is doing a wonderful uh, way of doing that, and, and some of the tools now are starting to mature and be sophisticated enough where they provide that augmented intelligence that Steve talked about earlier. So, it's complicated. It is, there's yes. infrastructure, there's security, there's a lot of software, there's skills, and on and on. At IBM Think this year, Ginny Rometty talked about, there were a couple of themes. One was augmented intelligence. That was something that was, that was clear. She also talked a lot about you know, privacy and you own your own data, et cetera. One of the things that struck me was her discussion about incumbent disruptors. So if you look at the top five companies, roughly Facebook with fake news has dropped down a little bit, but, <laughs> but top five companies in terms of market cap in the US, they're data companies, right? Apple just hit a trillion, Amazon, Google, et cetera. How do those incumbents close the gap? You know, is that concept of incumbent disruptors actually something that is being put into practice? I mean, you guys work with a lot of practitioners. How are they going to close that gap with the data haves, meaning data at their core of their business, versus the data have nots? It's not that they don't have a lot of data, but it's in silos. It's hard to get to. Yeah, Thoughts? I got one more thing. So. You know, these companies and, and whoever's going to be big next is you have a digital persona, whether you want it or not. So if you live in on a farm out in the middle of Oklahoma, you still have a digital persona. People are collecting data on you. They're putting profiles of you. And the big companies know about you. And people that might first interact with you, um, they're going to know that you have this digital persona. Personal AI, when AI from these companies can be used simply and easily from a personal deal to fill in those gaps and to have a digital persona that supports your, your family, uh, your growth, your both personal and professional growth, and those type of things, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of applications for AI on a personal enterprise, even small business that have not been done yet, but the data is being collected now. So you talk about the oil, the oil is being built right now. Lots and lots and lots of it. It's the applications to use that and, and turn that into something personally, professionally, educationally powerful. That's what's missing. But it's coming. 
So I'll, I'll add to that and then answer to your question too, right? So one example we always use in banking is if you look at the big banks, right? And then you look at from a consumer perspective, and there's a lot of talk about Amazon being a bank. But the thing is, Amazon doesn't need to be a bank. They provide banking services. From a consumer perspective, they don't really care if you're a bank or you're not a bank. But what's different between Amazon and some of the banks is that Amazon, like you say, has a lot of data. And they know how to make use of the data to offer something that's relevant that consumers want. Whereas banks, they have a lot of data, but they're all siloed, right? So it's not just a matter of whether or not you have the data. It's also can you actually access it and make something useful out of it so that you can create something that consumers want. Because otherwise, you're just a pipe. Totally agreed. Like When you look at it from a perspective of there's a lot of terms out there, digital transformation is thrown out so much, right? And you know, go to cloud and you migrate to cloud and you're gonna take everything over. But really when you look at it, and you both touched on it, it's the economics. You have to look at the data from an economics perspective and how do you make some kind of way to take this data meaningful to your customers that's gonna work effectively for them that they're gonna drive. So when you look at the big, big cloud providers, I think the push and things that's gonna happen in the next few years is there's just gonna be a bigger migration to public cloud. So then between those, they have to differentiate themselves. Uh, obvious is, is artificial intelligence in a way that makes it easy to aggregate data from across platforms, to aggregate data from multi-cloud effectively, to use that data in a meaningful way that's gonna drive not only better decisions for your business and better you know, outcomes, but drives opportunities for customers, drives opportunities for employees and how they work. We're at a really interesting point in technology where we get to tell technology what to do. It's going beyond us. It's no longer what we're telling it to do, it's gonna go beyond us. So how we effectively manage that is gonna be where we see that data flow and, and those big five or big four you know, really take that to the next now, level. Now, one of the other things that Ginny Rometty said was, I forget the exact stat, but it was like 80% of the data is you know, not searchable. You know, kind of implying that it's sitting somewhere behind a, a firewall, and presumably on somebody's premises. So it was kind of interesting. You know, you're talking about certainly a lot of momentum for public cloud, but at the same time, a lot of data is gonna stay where it is. Yeah, and we're assuming that a lot of this data is just sitting there available and ready. And we look at the desperate or desperate uh, kind of database situation where you have 29 databases and two of them have unique quantifiers that tie together and the rest of them don't. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing that you can do with that data. So artificial intelligence is just that. It's artificial intelligence. So they know that's machine learning, that's you know, natural language, that's classification. There's a lot of different parts of that that are moving, but we also have to have IT, good data infrastructure, master data management, compliance. Mm -hmm. There's so many moving parts to this that it's not just about the data anymore. Yeah, I, so I want to ask I think, Steve oh, to chime in here. Go, go ahead. Yeah, so um, we also have to change the mentality a bit. It's just not enterprise data. There's data on the web, the biggest thing is Internet of Things. The amount of sensor data will make the current data look like, you know, chump change. Um, so it's, data is moving faster, okay? And this is where the uh, sophistication of machine learning needs to kick in. Going from just mostly supervised learning today to unsupervised learning. And in order to really get into, uh, as I said, big data, you know, does, a, you know, and credible AI does the who, what, where, when, and how, but not the why. And this, this is really the holy grail to crack. And it's actually under new, th a new moniker is called explainable AI because it moves beyond just correlation into root cause analysis. Once we have that, then you have the means to be able to tap into augmented intelligence where humans are working with the machines. Karen, please. Yeah, so one of the things, like uh, to what Carla was saying and what a lot of us have said, like I like to think of the advent of ML technologies and AI going to help me as a data architect to, do, to love my data better, right? So that includes protecting it. But also, like when, when you say that 80% of the data is unsearchable, it's not just an access problem, it's that no one knows it, knows what it was, what the sovereignty was, what the metadata was, what the quality was, 
or why there's huge anomalies in it. So my favorite story about this is in the 1980s, about, I forget the exact number, but like 8 million children disappeared out of the U.S. in April, at April 15th. And that was when the IRS enacted a rule that in order to have a dependent, a deduction for a dependent on your tax returns, um, you had, they had to have a valid Social Security number. And people who had accidentally miscounted their children and over-claimed them over the years stopped <laughs> Oops. Stop! Stopped doing that. Well, some days it does feel like you have eight children yeah. running around. So, Agreed. when, when, when that rule came about, literally, and they're not all children because they're dependents, but literally millions of children disappeared off the face of the earth in April. But if you were doing analytics or AI and ML, and you don't know that this anomaly happened, like I can imagine, in a hundred years, someone is saying some catastrophic event happened in <laughs> April 1983, and. Like, what caused that? Was it health care? Was it a, a meteor? Was it the cloud yeah, attacking yeah, that was, was That's it where I was going. <laughs> right. So those are really important things that I want to use AI and ML to help me not only document and capture that stuff, but to provide that information to the people, the data scientists and the analysts that are using the data. Great story. Thank you. Bob, you got a thought? Get the mic. Go. Jump in here. Well, yeah, I do have a thought, actually. The, the, uh, I was talking about, about uh, what, what Karen was talking about. I think it's really important that not only that we understand AI and machine learning and data science, but that, that the regular folks and companies understand that at the basic level. Because those are the people who will ask the questions who, or, or who know what questions to ask of the data. And if they don't have the tools and the knowledge of, of how to get access to that data or even how to pose a question, then that data is going to be less valuable, I think, to companies. And the more, the more that everybody knows about data, even people in Congress. Remember when, when Zuckerberg <laughs> talked about, oh, that about was Facebook, scary. how do you make money? It's like, we all know this. Yeah. So, yeah. But, but we need to educate the masses on just basic data analytics. We could have an hour-long panel on that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Peter, you and I were talking about, um, we has, had a couple of questions, sort of how far can we take artificial intelligence? How far should we? You know, so that brings in the conversation of, of ethics and bias. Why don't you pick it up? Yeah, so one of, the, one of the crucial things that we all are implying is at some point in time, AI is going to become a feature of the operations of uh, our homes, <laughs> our businesses, and as these technologies get more powerful and they diffuse, the knowledge about how to use them diffuses more broadly, uh, and you put more options into the hands of more people, the question slowly starts to turn from can we do it to should we do it? And one of the issues that I introduce is I think the difference between big data and AI, AI specifically is this notion of agency. The AI will act on behalf of perhaps you or it'll act on behalf of your business. And that conversation is not being had today. It's being, you know, it's being had in arguments between Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg which pretty quickly get pretty boring. Uh, at the end of the day, the real question is, should this machine, whether in concert with others or not, be acting on behalf of me, on behalf of my business, or, yeah. and, by, and when, I, when I say on behalf of me, I'm also talking about privacy, because Facebook is acting on behalf of me. It's not just what's going on in my home. So that question of can it be done, a lot of things can be done, and an increasingly number of things will be able to be done. We gotta start having a conversation about should it be done. So humans exhibit tribal behavior, they exhibit bias, their machine's gonna mm -hmm. pick that up. Go ahead, please. Yeah, one thing to sort of tag on to agency of artificial intelligence. Every industry, every business is now about identifying information and data sources and their appropriate sinks and learning how to draw value out of connecting the sources with the sinks. Artificial intelligence enables you to identify those sources and sinks, and when it gets agency, it will be able to make decisions on your behalf about what data is good, what data means, and who it should be or what delivered actions to. Are good. Or what actions are good. And what data was used to make those actions. Absolutely. And was that the right data, and is there bias in the data? and all the way down, all the turtles down. So all this, the, the data pedigree will be driven by the agency of artificial intelligence, and this is a big issue. 
it's really fundamental to understand and educate people on there are like four fundamental types of bias, right? So there's, in machine learning, there's intentional bias. Hey, we're going to make the algorithm do generate a certain outcome regardless of what the data says. There's the source of the data itself, historical data that's trained on the models built on flawed data. The model will behave in a flawed way. There's um, target source, which is, so, for example, we know if you pull data from a certain social network, that network itself has an inherent bias. No matter how representative you try and make the data, it's still going to have flaws in it. Or if you pull healthcare data about, for example, uh, African Americans from, from the U.S. healthcare system, because of societal biases, that data will always be flawed. And then there's tool bias. There's limitations to what the tools can do. And so we will intentionally exclude some kinds of data or, or not use it because we don't know how to or our tools are not able to. And if we don't teach people what those biases are, they won't know to look for them. I know yeah, it's, it's like, you know, one of the things that we were talking about before. I mean, artificial intelligence is not going to just create itself. It's lines of code. It's input, and it spits out output. So it, it learns from these learning sets, and we don't want AI to become another buzzword. We don't want everybody to be an AR guru that has no idea what AI is. It takes months and months and months for these machines to learn. These, these learning sets are so very important because that input is how this machine, think of it as your child. And that's basically the way artificial intelligence is learning like your child. You're feeding it these learning sets. And then eventually it will make its own decisions. So we know from some of us having children that you, know, you teach them the best that you can, but then later on when they're doing their own thing, they're really it's like a little minor bird. They've heard everything that you said. Not only the things that you said to them directly, but the things that you said indirectly. Well, there, there are, there are uh, some very good AI researchers that might disagree with that metaphor exactly. But <laughs> having said that, um, what I think is very interesting about this conversation is that this notion of bias, one of the things that fascinates me about where AI goes, are we going to find a situation where tribalism more deeply infects business. Mm -hmm. Because we know yeah. that human beings do not seek out the best information. They seek out information that reinforces their beliefs. Right. And that happens in business today. Absolutely. You know, my line of business versus your line of business. Engineering versus sales. That happens today. But it happens at a planning level. And when we start talking about AI, we have to put the appropriate dampers, understand the biases, so that we don't end up with deep tribalism inside a business. Because AI could have the deleterious effect that it actually starts ripping apart organizations. Well, the input is data, and then the output is, could be a lot of things. Could be a lot of things. Yeah. And, and that's that where I said data equals human lives. So if we look at the case in New York where the, the penal system was using this artificial intelligence to make this choices on people that were released from prison, and they saw that that was a miserable failure because people that were released actually reoffended some, you know, committed murder and other things. So, I mean, it, it's it's... It's more than what anybody really thinks. It, it's not just, you know, oh, well, we just trained the machines and a couple of weeks later they're, they're good. You know, we never have to touch them again. These things have to be continuously tweaked. So just because you built an algorithm or a model doesn't mean you're done. You've got to go back later and continue to, to tweak these models. Mark, you got the mic. Yeah, no, I think one thing, we've talked a lot about the data that's collected, but what about the data that's not collected? Incomplete profiles, incomplete data sets, that's a form of bias, and, and sometimes that's the worst, because they'll fill that in, right, um, and then you can get some bias. But there's also a real issue for that around cybersecurity. Um, logs are not always complete, things aren't always done, um, and when things are doing that, people make assumptions based on what they've collected, not what they didn't collect. So when they're, when they're looking at this and they're going using the AI on it, that's only on the data collected, not on that that wasn't collected. So if something is down for a little while and no data is collected off that, the assumption is, well, it was down or it was impacted or there was a breach or whatever. It could be any of those. So you got to, you know, there's still, there's, there's still this human need uh, there's still the need for humans to look at the data and realize that there is the bias in there. There is, we're just looking at what, what data was collected um, and you're going to have to make your own uh, thoughts around that and, ha and assumptions on how to actually use that data before you go make those decisions that can impact lots of people at a human level, enterprises, profitability, things like that. And too often people think of AI when it comes out of there, that's the word. 
Well, that's, it's not the word. Yeah. You, well, can I ask a question about this? Please. Does that mean that we shouldn't act? It does not. Okay. It does so not. where's the fine line? Yeah, I think. Going back to the notion of can we do it or should we do it? I, I, I think you should, should do it. Should we act? Yeah, I think you should do it, but you should use it for what it is. It's augmenting. It's helping you, assisting you to make a valued or, or a good decision. And hopefully it's a better decision you would, would, than you would have made without it. I think it's great. I think it also your answer is right, too, that you have to iterate faster and faster and faster and discover sources of information or sources of data that you're not currently using and that's why this thing starts right, getting right. really Right, and I, I think you touch on a really good point about, you know, should you or shouldn't you? You look at Google and you look at the data that they've been using and some of that out there, you know, from a digital twin perspective is not being approved or not authorized and even once they've made changes, it's still floating around out there. Where do you know where it is? So there's this dilemma of how do you have a digital twin that you want to have and it's going to work for you and it's going to do things for you to make your life easier to do these things mundane tasks whatever but how do you also control it to do things you don't want it to do ad-based business models are inherently evil well yes. they, there's incentives to appropriate our data and so are things maybe who are things like blockchain potentially going to give users the ability to control their data and we'll see well no, and i think no, I'm sorry, but that's, that's actually a really important point. The idea of consensus yeah. algorithms, whether it's blockchain or not, blockchain includes yeah, some games and something right. along those lines, whether it's you know, Byzantine fault tolerance or whether it's you know, Paxos, consensus-based algorithms are going to be really, really important parts of this conversation because the data is going to be more distributed and you're going to have more elements participating in it. And so something that allows you know, especially in the machine to machine world, which is a lot of what we're talking about right here, you may not have blockchain because there's no need for a sense of incentive, which is what blockchain can help provide. And there's no middleman. And it's long, right? but, there's, but it's really, okay. it's, the thing that makes blockchain so powerful is for, it, it, allows, it liberates new classes of applications. But for a lot of the stuff that we're talking about, you can use a very powerful consensus algorithm without having that game sure. side and do some really amazing things at scale. So, so looking at blockchain, that's a great thing to bring up, right? I think what's inherently wrong with the way we do things today and the whole overall design of technology, whether it be on-prem or off-prem, is both the lock and key is behind the same wall, whether that wall is in a cloud or behind a firewall. Mm -hmm. So really, when there is an audit or when there is a forensics, it always comes down to a sysadmin or something else, and the system administrator will have the finger pointed at them because it all resides. You can edit it, you can augment it, or you can do things with it that you can't really determine. Now take, as an example, blockchain, where you've got really the source of truth. Now you can take and have the lock in one place and the key in another place. So that's you know, certainly going to be interesting to see how that unfolds. Right. So one of the things, it's, it's good that we've hit a lot of buzzwords right now, right? <laughs> AI, ML, block, we got the, bingo. the blockchain bingo. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things is, um, you also brought up, I mean, ethics and everything. And one of the things that I've noticed over the last year or so is that as I attend briefings or demos, everyone is now claiming that their product is AI or ML enabled or blockchain enabled. And when you try to get answers to the questions, what you really find out is that some things are being pushed as because they have if-then statements somewhere in their code, and therefore that's artificial intelligence or machine learning. And At if least you it's ask, not go-to. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're that experienced as well. So, <laughs> so, I mean, this is part of the thing you try to do as a as a practitioner, as an analyst, as an influencer, is trying to you know the hype of it all, right? And recently I attended one where they said they use blockchain and I couldn't figure it out. And it turns out they use goods to identify things. And that's not blockchain, <laughs> that's just an identifier. So one of the ethics things that I think we as a enterprise community have to deal with is the over-promising of AI and ML and deep learning and recognition. Like, it's not, I don't really consider it visual recognition services if they just look for red pixels. I mean, that's not quite the same thing. Yet, this is also making things much harder for your average CIO, or worse, CFO, to understand whether they're getting any value from these technologies. Old model. And, Old model, right? yeah. and, and I wonder if the, the data companies like that you talked about, or the top five, 
I'm more concerned about their nearly or actual $1 trillion um, valuations having an impact on their ability of other companies to disrupt or enter into the field more so than their data technologies. Like Again, we're coming to another perfect storm of the, the companies that are, have data as their asset, even though it's still not on their financial statements, which is another indicator whether it's really an asset, is that do we need to think about the terms of AI, about whose hands it's in, and who's, like, once one large trillion dollar company decides that you are not a profitable company, how many other companies are gonna buy that data and make that decision about you? Well, and for the first time in there. business history, I think this is true, we're seeing, because of digital, because it's data, you're seeing tech companies traverse industries, you know, get into whether it's content or music or publishing or groceries, and that's powerful and that's scary. awful scary. If you're a manager, one of, your, one, of the, one of the things your ownership is asking you to do is to reduce asset specificities so that their capital can be applied to more productive uses. Data reduces asset specificities. Yeah. It brings into question the whole notion of vertical industry. You're absolutely right. But you know, it's, uh, one, one question I got for you, Please. playing off of this is again, it goes back to this notion of can we do it and should we do it? I find it interesting, if you look at those top five, all data companies, but all of them have very different business models, or they, they can classify the two different business models. Apple is transactional, Microsoft is transactional, Google is ad-based, Facebook is ad-based, before the fake news stuff. Amazon's <laughs> kind of playing in both sides. Yeah, they're kind of all on a collision course though, aren't yeah, they? But, but well, that's, that's what's going to be interesting. Yeah. I think at some point in time, the can we do it, should we do it question is, brands are going to be identified by whether or not they are they have gone through that process of thinking about, should we do it, and say no. Apple is clearly, for example, incorporating that into their brand. Well, Silicon Valley, broadly defined, they include Seattle and maybe Armok, <laughs> not so much IBM, but they've got a dual disruption agenda. They've always disrupted horizontal tech. Now they're disrupting vertical industries. It's yeah. quite amazing. I thought. Oh, I was actually just going to pick up on what she was talking about. We're talking about buzzword, right? So one word we have, I haven't heard yet is voice. Voice is another big buzzword right now when you couple that with IoT and AI. Here you go, bingo. Do I got three points? <laughs> exactly, voice, voice recognition, voice, voice technology. So all of the smart speakers, if you think about that in the world, there are 7,000 languages being spoken. But yet, if you look at Google Home, you look at Siri, you look at you know, any, any of the devices, I would challenge you. It would have a lot of problem understanding my accent in the evening when my British accent creeps out. Or it will have trouble understanding seniors because the way they talk is very different than a typical 25-year-old person living in Silicon Valley, right? So how do we solve that, especially going forward? We're seeing voice technology is going to be so much more prominent in our homes. We're going to have it in the cars. We have it in the kitchen. It does everything. It listens to everything that we are talking about or not talking about and records it and to your point is it going to start making decisions on our behalf but then my question is how much does it actually understand us yeah. so I just want to, one short story Siri can't translate a word that I ask it to translate into French because my phone's set to Canadian English and that's not supported so I live in a bilingual French English country and it can't translate but what, what this is really bringing up is if you look at society and culture, what's legal, what's ethical changes across the years. What was right 200 years ago is not right now. What was right 50 years ago is not right now. It changes across countries. So it, today. it changes across countries, it changes across regions. So what does this mean when our AI has agency? How do we make ethical AI if we don't even know how to manage the change of what's right and what's wrong in human society? Well, wow. One of the most important questions we have to worry about, right? Absolutely. Well, we got but, but it also says one more thing, just before we go on. It also says that the issue of economies of scale in the cloud yes. are going to be strongly impacted not just by how big you can build your data centers, but some of those regulatory issues that are going to influence strongly what constitutes good experience, good law, good you know, acting on yes. my behalf, agency, And one thing that's underappreciated in the marketplace right now is the impact of data sovereignty. If you get back to data, 
countries are now recognizing the importance of managing that data and they're implementing data sovereignty rules. Third, everyone talks about California issuing a new law that's aligned with GDPR and you know what that meant. There are 30 other states in the United States alone that are modifying their laws to address this issue. Line up, Steve. So, um, so one comp, we're not, we got a, a number of years, no matter what Craig Kurzweil says, until we get to artificial general intelligence. So <laughs> the singularity is not so near. Right. Well, <laughs> do, do, you, do you know that he's changed the date over the last 10 years? I, I didn't you know, know that. Quite a bit. Um, and I don't even prognosticate where it's going to be. But really, the, where we're at right now, is I keep on coming back to, is that's why augmented intelligence is really going to be the new rage, humans working with machines. One of, the hot, one of the hot topics, and the reason I chose to uh, speak about it, is, is the future of work. There's a lot, of, I don't care if you're a millennial, you know, mid-career, or baby boomer, people are paranoid. As machines get smarter, if your job is routine cognitive, yes, you have a higher propensity to be automated. So what this really put, this really shifts a number of things. A, you have to be a, a lifelong learner, You've got to you know, learn new skill sets, um, and the dynamics are changing fast. Now, this is also a great equalizer for emerging startups and even in SMBs. As the AI improves, they, be, they can become more nimble. So back to your point regarding colossal trillion dollar, wait a second. There's going to be quite a sea change going on right now. And uh, regarding you know, demographics, in 2020, millennials take over as the majority of the workforce. By 2025, it's 75%. Great news. As a baby boomer, <laughs> as a baby boomer I try my damnedest to stay relevant. Yeah, surround yourself with millennials is the takeaway there. Yeah. <laughs> or retire. <laughs> yeah. Not yet. One thing I think, and this goes back to what Karen was saying, if you want a basic standard to, to put around this stuff, look at the old ISO 38500 framework. Business strategy, technology strategy, you have risk, compliance, change management, operations, and most importantly, the balance sheet and the financials. AI and, and what Tony was saying about digital transformation, if, if it's of meaning, it belongs on a balance sheet and, and should factor into how you value your company. All the cybersecurity and all the compliance and all the regulation is all stuff, this framework exists, so look it up, and every time you start some kind of new machine learning project or data science project, say, have we checked the box on each of these standards that's within this medicine? If you haven't, maybe slow down and, and do your homework. Oh, do we I see think a day when data is going to be valued on the balance sheet. It is. Yeah, well, it, it's well, fun. Absolutely. It's already valued as part of the current, it's, but yeah, it's certainly it's goodwill. Certainly market value, yeah. as we were just talking yeah. about. Well, we're talking about all the companies that have opted in, right? Um, there's tens of thousands of small businesses just in this region alone that are opt out. They're small family businesses or businesses that really aren't even technology aware. Uh, but data is being collected about them. It's being put on Yelp. They're being rated. They're being reviewed. The success of their business is out of their hands. And I think what's really going to be interesting is you look at the big data, you look at AI, you look at things like that. Blockchain may even be a potential for, for some of that because of immutability. But it's when all of those businesses, when the technology becomes, um, a, becomes a cost it's cost prohibitive now for a lot of them, or they just don't want to do it and they're proudly opt out. Um, in fact, we talked about that last night at dinner. But when they opt in, the company that can do that and can reach out to them in a way that is economically feasible and bring them back in where they control their data, where they control their information, um, and they do it in such a way where it helps them build their business. Um, and it may be a generational business that's been passed on. Um, th those kind of things are going to make a big impact, not only on the cloud, but the data being stored in the cloud, the AI, the applications that you talked about earlier, we talked about that. And that's where this bias and some of these other things are going to have a, a tremendous impact if they're not dealt with now, uh, at least ethically. Well, I feel like we just, we just got started. Yeah. We're out of time, but oh. time for a couple more comments. And then we, yeah, I had one thing to say. Please. I mean, really, Henry Ford and the creation of the automobile back in the early 1900s changed everything because now we're no longer stuck in the country. We can, you know, get away from our parents. We can date without, you know, grandma and grandpa sitting on the porch with us. We can take long trips. 
so now we're looked at, we've sprawled out, we're not all, you know, living in the country anymore, and it changed America. So AI has that same capabilities. Mm -hmm. It will automate r mundane, routine tasks that nobody wanted to do anyway. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, a lot of that will, will you know, change things, but it's, it's not going to be any different than the way things changed in the early 1900s. Like you were saying, constant reinvention. Yeah. I think that's a great point. Let me make one observation on that. Every, every period of significant industrial change was preceded by the formation, a period of formation of new assets that nobody knew yeah. what to do with. Absolutely. Whether it was what do we do, you know, when industrial manufacturing, it was row houses with long shafts tied to an engine that was coal fired and drew, drove a bunch of loons. Same thing, you know, uh, uh, railroads, large factories for Henry Ford before he figured out how to do uh, an information based notion of, you know, mass production. This is the period of asset formation for the next generation yeah. of social structures. Chip makers are going to be all over these cars. I mean, you're going to have <laughs> augmented reality right yeah. there on your windshield. All right, Karen, bring it home. <laughs> oh, so Give I us think, the drop the yeah. mic moment. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure, Mike. <laughs> your AV guys are not happy with that. Um, so I think that, you know, it all comes down to it's a people problem, a challenge, let's say that. The whole AI ML thing, a people, it's a legal compliance thing. Enterprises are going to struggle with trying to meet 5 billion different types of compliance rules around data and its uses, about enforcement, because ROI is going to mean risk of incarceration as well as return on investment, and we'll have to manage both of those. Um, I think businesses are struggling with a lot of this complexity and these, like, we just, oh, you just opened a whole bunch of questions that we really didn't have solid, oh, you can fix it by doing this. So it's important that we think of this new world of data-focused, data-driven, everything like that, is that the entire IT and business community needs to realize that focusing on data means we have to change how we do things and how we think about it. But we also have some of the same old challenges there. Well, I have a feeling we're going to be talking about this uh, for quite some time. What a great way to wrap up Cube NYC here, our third day of activities down here at, uh, at 37 Pillars or Mercantile 37. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank really you. wonderful That's insights, great. really appreciate it. Now all this content is gonna be available on thecube.net. Uh, we are exposing our video cloud and our video search engine so you'll be able to search our entire corpus of data. I can't wait to start <laughs> searching and clipping up this session. Again, thank you so much and thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. <laughs>